Hello everyone, I'm Sean Carey with Migration Productions. Welcome and thanks for joining me for another video in our Exploring the Natural World YouTube series. However, before I get started, I'd really like to say I hope everyone is healthy and staying safe. Uh, we will get through these tough times, but for now, just hang in there, you know, and rest assured the better days are absolutely ahead of us. However, for today's video, it's going to be the first in a three-part series from a documentary called A Wing and a Care that I helped co-produce uh, with my good friend Jim Grady. It profiles three individuals and the bird species they've been working to protect, and it's all tied together by one common thread. Each advocate is dedicated to their respective species' survival, to protecting them, and to raising awareness about the threats that they're currently facing. I think you'll see the dedication uh, and tireless work of each of them and how one person can make a huge difference in the lives of these birds. You know, if we choose to take action and to get involved ourselves, I think each one of us can help drive bird conservation forward and play a critical role in helping to safeguard the wildlife around us. I think that's very important. In the first segment, I'd like to introduce you to my friend Norman Smith. Uh, many of you that live here in the greater Boston area or anywhere really in New England, uh, you may have heard of Norman. Uh, Norman has worked at the Mass Audubon Blue Hills Trailside Museum in Milton, Massachusetts for the past 40 years. Uh, and he was the director of the Trailside Museum from 1990 until late 2019 when he retired. Uh, but he still works there part time uh, as a raptor specialist you know, because I think Norman values the conservation and educational work that Mass Audubon provides. Uh, Norman is really a remarkable individual. Uh, he's been banding snowy owls for over three decades, and he started the Snowy Owl Project in 1981. Uh, in fact, uh, he caught and banded his first snowy owl in 1977 at an old airfield just south of Boston. To date, Norman has banded over an astonishing 700 snowy owls. Think about that for one second. One individual has banded over 700 snowy owls, and that's Norman Smith. That's pretty incredible. If you need a sense of how important the work that Mass Audubon does for bird conservation is, I recently spoke with Norman and I asked him, how old was the oldest snowy owl that he'd ever caught? He told me he caught a previously banded owl in April 2015, and its record showed that it was a mind-blowing, get this, 23 years and 10 months old. An almost 24-year-old snowy owl is simply amazing, and it shows what banding records can do. You know, by providing this kind of data, banding helps us better understand more about this species and how long-lived they can be in their natural habitat. This is critical information. But don't just take my word for it. Instead, let's hear from the man himself, Norman Smith. Enjoy. The snowy owl casts a spell over all who encounter it. Graceful, majestic, powerful, and mysterious, it is the essence of nature at its most wild. Spending much of the year on the high Arctic tundra, snowy owls inhabit a challenging world. After a short summer of mild temperatures and nearly constant sunlight, the mercury plummets to well below zero for the long, cold, dark winter. Many owls choose to ride out the winter in the Arctic, but every year, a number move south into southern Canada and the northern United States. Some find their way to New England, and when they do, Norman Smith is waiting for them. For more than 30 years, Smith, director of Mass Audubon's Blue Hills Trailside Museum in Milton, Massachusetts, has been studying these birds, learning their habits, gaining insights into their lifestyles. Through his Snowy Owl project, which he started in 1981, Smith has banded and released more than 700 birds, shedding light on migration routes, stopover points, where the owls spend their winters, and where they settle in to breed. Along the way, Smith has given countless public presentations in his relentless effort to promote snowy owl conservation. You'd be hard pressed to find anyone who's worked harder for them or done more to ensure that tomorrow's world still has a place for these spectacular, enigmatic birds. 
So one of the things when we think about snowy owls and think about their winter visits to Massachusetts is how many snowy owls normally come. And when we look at our records over the past 32 years, our best year for snowy owls was in 1986-87, that winter, we banded 43 snowy owls that were removed from Logan Airport. Um, then if you look at some other good years, you know, the winter of 88-89 was a good winter. We banded 39 snowy owls. And then in 2010-2011, we banded 42 snowy owls. But when you put that in perspective to what we've done so far this year, as of today, we've removed 115 snowy owls from Logan Airport. The first bird showed up at Logan Airport on November 17th, and by sometime in January, we had already banded 56 snowy owls. And by, you know, March 1st, uh, we had banded close to, you know, 100 snowy owls, and here we are in April, the beginning of April, and we've banded 150 snowy owls, something I never would have expected. Well, one of the things we do is we put a U.S. Fish and Wildlife band on one leg, and that's like having your social security number, and that bird will carry that with it for the rest of its life. One thing that's been helpful to us is by banding these owls, we've been able to document that some of these owls have returned to Logan Airport. We've had birds return a year, three, five, seven, ten, and one bird that came back 16 years later. So in 1999, we put satellite transmitters on these birds and actually tracked those birds. And out of 12 birds that we had transmitters on, three of the birds were unfortunately shot in Massachusetts, something we never expected. The other nine birds, however, did make it back to the Arctic. Uh, the birds that we've captured are birds that are in good condition, good body weight, good health. Uh, they certainly are not birds that are coming down here because there's no food in the Arctic and they're starving as people have anticipated in the past. One of the things about snowy owls that you know take place in the Arctic is that they set up a little breeding site. Uh, the male goes out and does a little courtship and catches lemmings and brings it back and shows the female he's a good provider. And in years when he catches lots of lemmings, the female lays lots of eggs. And when he doesn't bring any lemmings back because he's hungry, they don't breed. So snowy owls really breed according to what the lemming cycle is. And our research over the past 32 years has finally shown us that in years when we have lots of snowy owls around, they're mostly young birds and they're in really good condition. Will some of these birds die? Yes, they will. Like other raptors, a lot of you know, mortality takes place in young birds, but not necessarily through starvation. There are other things that take place that, that cause that mortality. So one of the things that we do when we catch the birds is we actually remove them and we bring them uh, south of Boston to coastal beaches and release them uh, in the early part of the season. Later in the season we bring them north to Parker River Wildlife Refuge and release them there because theoretically these birds are continuing their journey north. Uh, why do they show up at Logan Airport? Well, we've caught over 600 snowy owls and asked every single one and none have responded, so we really don't know. But if you took away the buildings, terminals, planes um, from that location, it looks very much like the Arctic tundra. Because when most people see snowy owls, they see them roosting. So they're sitting in one location, the bird's got one eye half open, half closed, looking around, and they say, well, there it is, a little bump sitting out there on the, the you know, the titled salt marsh or whatever, and it's not a very you know, active bird. However, once the sun goes down, those birds become incredibly active, and they are a bubo species of owl, which means that they're very similar to great horned owls. They have ear tufts, most people don't know that, they rarely keep them erect. Uh, however, they don't have the fringing on their outside feathers for silent flight like great horned owls do. They actually have longer wings, more pointed wings, they fly much like a falcon. And when you think about it, having an owl, a white owl, on a brown background in the Arctic tundra, when it's daylight, 24 hours a day, you have no camouflage, no stealth ability. So how do you catch your food? Speed. They're one of the fastest flying owls. They're not only fast, but they're incredibly agile. They take their prey very much like a falcon. They'll come in, drop their feet, catch it on the wing. They eat a variety of things, including mice, rats, rodents, small mammals, including muskrats, skunks. I've even seen them taking a cat. They eat a variety of other raptors, from American kestrel, northern harrier, um, sawwood owl, long-eared owl, short-eared owl, barred owl, barn owl, uh, and even peregrine falcon. Uh, they take large prey items as well, including Canada geese, brant geese, and even I photographed them taking great blue heron. 
Uh, these birds roost during the day. They're not a, a diurnal owl like most people think. When they're down here, they're pretty much nocturnal. Are they a diurnal owl in the Arctic? Absolutely. When you think about it, where they come from in the Arctic tundra, it's daylight for two and a half months. So if you had to wait for it to get dark, you'd be waiting a mighty long time. Well, with any young bird, uh, young raptors in particular, there's a high mortality rate. With great horned owls, it may be as high as 80 or 90% of young great horned owls that just don't make it to be an adult. And with snowy owls, it's probably a similar situation. And when we see snowy owls that come down here, we've had birds that have been electrocuted. We've had birds that die from rodenticide poisoning. We have birds that end up with a broken wing or a broken leg. And yes, in fact, they do starve to death, but it's because they have some other means that cause them that injury. So there's a variety of things that cause deaths to these birds um, other than just coming down here and starving to death. If someone found an injured snowy owl, what they can do is they can actually go to the uh, Mass Fish and Wildlife website that has wildlife rehabilitators and they can contact those rehabilitators. The, certainly the best place for them to bring a bird would be Tufts Veterinary Clinic in Grafton. It would get the best care out there to see if they could rehabilitate it and get it back to the wild. If someone does encounter and find a dead snowy owl, then they should contact the Division of Fisheries and Wildlife uh, and have that bird picked up so we can examine it to see why the bird died. And then it can go to an institution or an educational facility to be used as an education bird or an educational tool or in a skin collection. Well, when we started the Snowy Owl Project, one of the things that we did is we created a project so that we could do a long-term study on them. Because with any species, if you want to get a lot of information on it, you have to do it over a long period of time. And so what we've done is we've been able to do uh, fundraising for the Snowy Owl Project through things like Birdathon, um, donations. We had an anonymous donor that actually allowed us to buy satellite transmitters to actually start the transmitter project which was great, and we continued to use donations to actually work on this project. One of the misnomers people have is that Massport provides funding for this project and we get paid by the airport to take these owls away from the airport. And that's not true. We actually do this on a voluntary basis. Uh, I don't spend my days catching snowy owls and other raptors. I catch, spend my mornings and evenings after work to actually do this. So I actually go out and spend a lot of my own time to work on this project and it's through the generous uh, donations from people that allows us to continue this work. Well there you go. Norman has demonstrated very clearly how one person can drive positive change uh, and make a critical impact on the ongoing survival of these birds. It's really up to us to take a stand and to get involved to do what we can do individually and more importantly, I think what we can do collectively to protect these beautiful animals. So go out there, find a bird or any other species that you care about and please get involved. Uh, making a donation is a great way to contribute, but there are also plenty of organizations uh, looking for volunteers to help with their conservation efforts. So if you have a skill that might be helpful, just do it. Don't underestimate what you can do and how much you're able to help. You can make a difference. You can absolutely make a difference. Uh, if you want to make a donation to help bird conservation, I'll leave the link below for the Snowy Owl Project, and I would encourage you to check it out. Uh, if you enjoyed this segment of A Wing and a Care, please hit the like button and subscribe so you don't miss any future videos here on Exploring the Natural World. Also, feel free to leave a comment or a suggestion for a future topic or a guest. And again, thanks for tuning in. Take care. Please remember, help protect wildlife and help protect wild places. Cheers.